All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome to tonight's program. I am absolutely elated for, to have you join us. Got Thrash Pondo Pons with me, as always. And I'm also elated to talk about the subject we're going to be talking about. Uh, one of our Honeycomb Hideout listeners um, uh, suggested this quite a while ago. And, and he knows who he is. He knows who he is. And you know who he is. He's Mr. John Collins. Johnny. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I had talked about uh, doing, um, uh, well, I had talked before, kind of incidentally in passing, about how sometimes I'll get to teach in a philosophy class. And one of my favorite things to teach is kind of the philosophy of music and uh, how different philosophies have affected music and the music that, that it produced and then how that music kind of affected society and going through really kind of the 60s, 70s, 80s and 90s and looking at the different uh, the different types of music and how it's related to both philosophy and religion. Um, and uh, John Collins said, hey, uh, you should do this as a live stream. And I've been intending to do it as a live stream for quite a while. So tonight is the night. I'm flying a little, little bit off the cuff. I've taught on this subject a number of times. Mm, so I should have my information pretty well at hand. But you might forgive me if I you know, go, uh, 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 and can't think of a name or something like that. That normally happens anyway. You know, when we're even when we're talking about just the arts and entertainment, that kind of happens. With me, as always, is my good friend Thrash Pondo Pons. How is the weather where you are treating you? Thankfully, tonight we're just getting heavy rain and not more heavy snow. Although people seem to love those images of my frozen pond. It's like something of Dr. Zhivago. Right. You know, so, but for right now, just heavy rain, which is washing most of that snow away. Yeah. So. Better luck next time, huh, folks. <laughs> right, and uh, and you and I were both on um, uh, Flick Snacks and Nick Knacks yes, uh, we were. show on Friday. Had a blast. It was, it was awesome. Wasn't it that awesome? It really was a lot of fun. Yes, it was a lot of fun. Uh, we go over to Flick Snacks and check it out. We it's the one that's entitled or titled. What's it titled? Uh, Eon Flux versus Equilibrium. Equilibrium. We, yeah. we did a uh, compare and comparison of those two movies and decided which one was the best of all time. Also joining us was uh, DJ Anubis and Lee Mateus, and they were they were great to work with. Uh, you know, I'm working on getting uh, Lee Mateus on the show. I know he's young as far as he's not a Gen Xer at all. I think he's he looks really young. But I'm going to reach out to him real soon. I'm going to because he he does have affinities for Gen X. Especially, Huge. yeah, Gen X. Um, he's fascinated by the '80s. Yeah, and he so, has an interesting take on it because he's seeing it objectively. So it's it was yeah, interesting, uh, and and that it, that that piques my interest too. I'm like, well, I know he's young, but maybe we'll give him, you know, um, uh, like let him talk about how he views some of the culture and the arts and entertainments of the of Gen X. So that'll be fun. So if you're interested in watching that, head on over to Flick Snacks and Nick Knacks and check it out. Let's say so, let's say hi to some people. Let's let's. That's always fun. We get ah. Lance Javen says hi, gang. Hey, Lance, how you doing, buddy? Spike Spike says hello to Lance, but hello to you too, Spike. Good yes. to have you in the house. Hello, little interplay conversation happening there in the chat. That's all good. Trey Thrasmeyer says, hi, all. Hi, you, Tracy. Tracy. How are always you? It's great to see you. It's, it's always really good to see you, Tracy. Love you bunch. Uh, oh, and look who's in the house. Black Adder is joining us. Black Adder. Okay. Black Adder uh, says, I'm looking forward to seeing Pat's version of a live stream. But personally, I'm a little spent with the Brady Bunch stuff. I think Dave has had a couple of live streams where people talked Brady nonstop. And probably will again. It's one of their favorites. Yeah, it is a subject that I think it's a, a little wearing. You know, you kind of go through those phases where you talk about a subject a lot, then you don't talk about it at all. And then you talk about it a lot again. I think the Brady Bunch is one of those subjects, especially on a nostalgia show. But I'm interested in hearing Pat's take on it. You know, I want to listen to what he has to say. So... <sighs> Speaking of John Collins, John Collins in the house. How you yes. doing, Johnny? John. And John says, I've been waiting for this live stream forever. This topic is going to be awesome. You don't know the half of it, John. I hope I live up to everyone's expectations here. I feel so put on the spot. Oh, and 
Future Boy is in the house saying hello, everyone. Hello well, to you hello. Too, Future Boy. Well, hello, Future Boy. I'm glad you could be jo- joining us. Especially Welcome for this. to the party. This is going to be a fiery show. This is going to be a fiery show. You know what I mean? I'm, I think I'm going to wrestle some feathers up on this one. Mr. Led says, hey, folks. Hey to you, Mr. Led. Great to see you as always. Oh, Cindy Hello, Mr. Is in the Le- house. I didn't get to say hello to Mr. Led. I was taking a drink of my kind. Hang on. Wicked Mr. Sorry, Led, just... hello. Hello, Mr. Led. How you doing, buddy? Good to see you. All right. Now we can go to Cindy D. And hello to Cindy D. Hello to you, oh, too. Hello, Cindy. Really glad you are with us. And, uh, and uh, oh, Mr. Superplex. Superplex. Yes. Superplex. Hello, Mr. Led. Well, hello to you. Super black. Great to see you Hello. as well. Awesome. Well, if we do, we have some uh, questions. Any questions at this point? I just want, want to make sure that I've got Let's some see. questions down. And uh, if not, we'll say hi to people as they kind of uh, go into the channel here. But we can't say, you know, we can't keep saying hi as people pop into the channel. Otherwise, we'd never get to our subject. Um, and let me uh so let's take that off the screen oh here. sorry yes no it's quite all right <laughs> i was daydreaming so, in in a sub in a topic like this where we're talking religion we're talking philosophy and we're talking uh how it impacted particularly our culture and how it impacted even more particularly music one of the things that's challenging is where to start uh, so, I mean, as wanting to keep it on a Gen X topic, we're going to be centering around there. But at some point, but we have to, to some degree, reach into the past a little bit because what we've done um, and what we have in, in 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 our culture is predicated on what came in the previous culture and and ideas in the previous culture and 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 it's difficult to know where to stop like where do you stop like how far back do you reach in the past to really kind of explain the current situation and the current and the situation in which we live through as gen xers so i really like to start around the advent of television and around the 1950s 40s and 50s and dip a little bit back to tell you why that was such a significant shift and significant change and the reason why it was a significant shift and a significant change uh, is that information started to be um, started to be spread more quickly and that means information from the classroom to the public at large gets spread more quickly. See, before the advent of really television, some people say radio, but radio not so much. It was really television and then the ability to play tapes and cassettes and all that stuff and have your own uh, personal uh, library. Um, before that, when you learned a philosophy or you learned a theology or you learned religion, it tended to almost stay within the classroom. Religion, not so much. And we'll see why in a bit, because, you know, you have people who go to school and they become pastors and they're teaching a large group of people. But if you want to learn like the differences between like existentialism or you want to learn like humanism, Uh, or you want to learn, you know, like platonic philosophy or something like that, you really have to go to the classroom uh, and it stays in the classroom. It stays there. I mean, we're, you don't like have uh, evangelists for Plato, so to speak. You know what I mean? Right. I mean, when was the last time somebody knocked on your door and said, knock, knock, knock. Hey, I'm here to tell you about Plato and Aristotle and, uh, and platonic thought versus Aristotelian thought. You know, you just don't hear that too much, right? That just doesn't happen a whole lot. But you do hear people knocking on your door and who want to share some type of religious message with you. And that tends to be the difference. But with the advent of TV, you have the idea to place uh, philosophies in the, uh, in, into the common household, Uh, And people are getting a hold of these philosophies much more quickly. And that brings us to the philosophies at hand in the 40s and 50s. Uh, 
And to understand the first major step into what we experienced growing up Generation X is to really understand the hippie movement, okay? And the hippie movement was really a rebellion against, and this is where things kind of fall apart, but I'm only, you know, letting you factually know about what um, what has taken place in the past, okay? So this isn't me grinding a philosophy or grinding a theology at you at this point. This is just me really kind of telling you how it was. Uh, but the hippie movement was at least in part a rebellion against cultural Christianity. And by cultural Christianity, I mean the average person who lived in the 1940s and 1950s was Christian. I mean, th they were Christian in name, at least. They either went to a Catholic church or a Lutheran church or a Presbyterian church or something like that. You know, they just, th that was just basically what they what what they did however uh the rise of cultural christianity was a little stale okay it had lost its fervor and the um the 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 philosophy was basically a philosophy of what's called personal peace and affluency now by personal peace i don't mean i don't mean like oh meditate I'm not saying I'm not that's not what I'm saying uh I what I mean by personal peace is if you took a general consensus especially this is this is especially true of the middle upper class and upper class by personal peace I mean leave me alone I've got what I want and affluency I mean the ability to main to to gain and maintain wealth and unfortunately, that got tied to, um, uh, rightly or wrongly, that got tied, I'm not saying rightly or wrongly at this point, but that got tied to the Christian value system. And so it was just a matter of course that if you were a Christian, particularly if you bl belong to something like the Methodist Church or something like that, you were upper middle class or even rich, and you wanted personal peace and affluency. Well, that is that is like, that's like having... So it's like having like a, a a meal, but not being able to tell you like what any of the ingredients are or why you're having a meal. Okay, so like um, uh, like a good example of this is like, you, do you know what a calorie is, Frash Pondo? Yes. Okay, like like I didn't know what a calorie is. Most people don't know. Like we all agree that there's calories, but we couldn't define it. But do it's you know a what? Go ahead. Yeah, it's a, it's a thermal unit of uh, uh, organic uh, congestible material. Right, right. Uh, and, and but a lot of people don't know. A lot of people think that almost. I when I was before I got into the health thing, I thought. I mean, everybody agrees what a calorie. You know yes. that, that there's a calorie. There's calorie X amount calorie. of calories in any food item. But I almost thought of it as almost like a constituent. Like almost like it was like a little building block, you know, like this has so many calories in it, you know, and and I didn't know and I didn't know what it was. Well, they so this this generation produced a generation of children and they told these children, you got to go to church. You got to be a good person. You got to do this. And they would say, well, well, why? You know, you, you got to go to school. You got to get a good education. And that first initial hippie generation said, it just sounds empty to me. It sounds sounds totally empty to me. And so you begin to have this rebellion uh, among them that was that was kind of unlike previous rebellions, kind of unlike, I mean, all kids kind of rebel a little bit. But this was off the rails. And they wanted meaning in their life. They didn't just want personal peace and affluency. They wanted meaning. And if you look at the first generation of hippies and their songs, they're all about having meaning, right? I mean, can you think of some of the songs of the hippie? Well, um, right off the top of my head. Well, someone actually in the chat mentioned "Turn, Turn, Turn," which yes. I thought I thought is very applicable in this stage here. But then there were a lot of others. There yeah. was, um, you know, in the year twenty five, twenty five, there was that song. Um, uh, uh, which was an early song uh, about pollution. Was it a 
um, before the breathing air is gone, before the sun is just a bright spot in the nighttime. It, right. it, it was all about some type of, you know, cause. Right, and right. Behind cause. Right, right. Are we getting any questions at this point? Because I'm going to dive straight into the hippie movement and some of what they produced. We have a very um, good question right here from Mr. Zuberplex. Was Charles Manson a substitute Jesus figure? Well, not to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, he wasn't a substitute Jesus figure. He was, how, however, he did have a Messiah complex. That's getting into some uh, psychology, too, and I'm not, I'm not uh, uh, equipped enough to discuss psychology. Um, um, Ian, are you saying that Catholics and Christians are one and the same? No, no. I mean, uh, I'm only talking culturally at this point. People who are culturally ca Catholic in the upper middle class shared a lot of the same kind of values externally, external values as somebody who would say be a Presbyterian. You know, the very strict moral guidelines and uh, not really understanding a lot of the meaning as to why you should have those strict moral guidelines. Just you have them to have them. And then this next generation doesn't have them at all. So we see that this this hippie uh, generation, they were the first they, they really wanted meaning. And the and was it very interesting because a lot of their music was really about like changing the world and making it a better place. They found they they thought it would be uh, um, <laughs> positive. What was that? What was that? Oh yes, up? Danny stayed in the house. Hello, Danny. Hello, Says, Danny. All How you're you doing, saying buddy? is give peace a chance. Give peace a chance, <laughs> yeah. right? And they wanted they wanted peace. They wanted they wanted it into wars and stuff. And then of course this flows into the, coming off the Second World War and everything. Now, the other uh, philosophy that gets uh, tied into this, and, and one of the, the fastest moving philosophies, generally, when somebody came up with a type of philosophy or a philosophical insight till it got to the general masses, was between 20 and 50 years. However, there was one philosophy that just ran gunshot quickly it went from it went from and that was and that was the, the philosophy of pragmatism okay pragmatism and pragmatism gave birth to relativism and this is part of what fuels the hippie movement okay so pragmatism is basically it, we're not interested in externally what's right or what's wrong we're interested in what works for me so if it works for me if it's pragmatic for me then uh, then that's what I'm going to do. And pragmata uh, doesn't doesn't deal with whether or not something might be right, something might, might be wrong ethically. It's just if it works for me and therefore it's right. And then therefore that gave birth to that you can have multiple um, you can have multiple uh, ethics and they can both be true because you might have a pragmat that works for you and i might have a prag pragmatic ideal that, uh, a situation that works for me um and that was a result that was actually a result of, of coming off of world war ii actually they just said hey you know let's get rid of this philosophy just kind of whatever works well um so the hippie movement so they wanted to make the world a better place and quite honestly they wanted to make a the world a better place for through drugs uh, we got a couple questions here, if you don't mind me bringing them up. Yes. Um, Future Boy says, wasn't Vietnam War was the main reason for the hippie movement? It was certainly one of the big ones. <laughs> well, that kind of came after the hippie movement. That actually came. Well, no, it was during the hippie movement. Sorry, I should say it ended at the at, at the. Sorry. It came during the hippie movement. Yes, it did. <laughs> it was one of the things that fueled it and why they were searching for peace. By the time the Vietnam War ended, uh, the, the, the hippie movement was, it was, was I, I don't want to say this like meanly, but like, you know, like when you cut a chicken's head off, like it doesn't just fall over, right? Like it, it, it flops around. Okay. Well, the chicken's head had been long cut off by the time the Vietnam war ended, not by the time it started, but the, the, the head of the hippie movement, metaphorically speaking, had been cut off by the time way before the Vietnam war ended, not before it began, but before it ended. 
Uh, now they wanted to, do you know how they wanted to um, influence the world? Thrash Pondo? Uh, the hippies per se? Yeah. What was their first, through music, yes, through their music ideal. Well, their ideals were expressed through music. But I'm going to give you a little hint. Mr. Tambourine Man, mm -hmm. Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Well, uh, you, uh, of course, we're referring, well, I think the Beatles, but we're referring to well, LS, uh, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds was, of course, LSD. Right. And what's Tambourine Man? You know, I'm not 100%. It's a euphemism for a drug dealer. Because you that weren't. That you would weren't make a lot of sense. Yeah, <laughs> you weren't allowed to talk about uh, uh, talk about drugs openly. But they really believed they really believed that the way to peace was through the through drugs. Uh, and uh, they didn't that start yeah. with the beatniks that were a early more militant form of hippies per se. Absolutely, absolutely started with the beatniks. Absolutely, um, <clears throat> but they 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 really now they they took drugs. Um, yes, leisurely for sure and for fun for sure, but they really had an ideal about drugs and their ideal, uh, was that, that it would change you. It would change people. It would bring this utopia. They really believe that it would bring this utopia. And you remember, I'm sure you remember, well, you probably don't remember cause you were there, but you remember cause you heard about it. What were they going to do with those drugs? They believed it so much that they were going to do something with drugs. You know what they're going to do? Off the top <laughs> of my head? No. What were they going to do with the drugs? They were going to drop it in the water supply. All right. They, I heard that. <laughs> they did. They, they, I, I believe that was in Rolling Stone magazine. They they believed in it so much in this turn turn on, turn off turn in whatever how what's the how's it go again uh uh turn on tune in uh tune, tune out, out drop out drop it's out either drop out or tune out yeah it's been years since i've heard the expression but yeah yeah and you can so you can see in their music particularly in their music this ideal i mean it's just everywhere in their music they really they really really believed that that drugs was going to solve the problem the problem is, is it didn't work and it didn't last very long before they started realizing that it didn't work. And then they, a lot of these people turned to Eastern mysticism. Um, they thought, well, that would work so that you got the, the, the Beatles, especially turning to, you know, uh, the, the gurus and stuff like that. The Maha, the Maharisha. Yeah. yeah. The Maharisha <laughs> kind of turning inward and stuff. There's been a couple questions here. I oh, think, yes. uh, let's see. Well, uh, uh, number one dude says, hey, Ian and Thrash. Hello to you, too. Number one. Dude. How you doing, number one? Hungry Jerk says, hi, everyone. Hi. Uh, oh, here's a juicy one. Mr. Led asks, uh, don't most cult leaders pass themselves off as Jesus, i.e. David Koresh? A lot of them do. I mean, a lot of them have Messiah complexes for sure, but not every single one pass them off, that, themselves off as um as jesus himself now uh you have to be careful do you mean like they believe that they're the messiah uh more of them do that do they believe that they're actually a reincarnation of jesus a re-emanation of jesus some do some don't uh do they all believe that, that they have the inside track to god yes 100 percent. they all that's that's their whole deal is they believe they have the 100 percent inside track to god so it just depends on how you define what you mean by jesus there do you mean jesus is a figure jesus literally you're going to see some and some there. There are some people out there who think, yes, I am going to, I am going to be just, I, I am the reincarnation of Jesus or the second advent of Jesus. So uh, Zuberbook says in the sixties, you had Jesus Christ superstar and Godspell, which were musicals combining the hippie movement with Christianity. Yep. Yeah, it was. And what's interesting about both of those uh, movements or both of those things is they all, they all don't have a resurrection scene. They all, when Jesus dies, he dies. I mean, that's it. There's no resurrection from, mm -hmm. uh, from the dead. And then they all try to explain uh, Jesus more. They all try to explain him away from um, um, his Jewish roots and kind of ma they make him more cultural, like just like a good guy. Like you, like he's just, he's like one of us. He's just like a really good guy. And if you ever want to read a refutation of that, read um, Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. Uh, he, yeah, there's, 
there's no way you can say Jesus is just a good person. He claimed to be God. He, he said he said some pretty crazy things. He was either who he claimed to be or he was out of his mind. Uh, really, I mean, quite honestly, he, you know, like he said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. He was either out of his mind or he was who he claimed to be. Uh, yes. Well, and Zubluk says the hippies were derived from the beatniks. Yes. Yes, for sure. Uh, oh, and the hungry jerk says, I didn't like easy rider and the weird hippies. Um, well, never saw easy rider. You. You've never seen Easy Rider? I know. <laughs> Shoot me. i never seen Godfather either. I mean, everybody's like, oh, geez, never seen Godfather. Godfather and Easy Rider. Got a couple of them. Oh, and Superflick says, Mia Farrow, one of the Beach Boys and the Beatles. And I believe he's referring to the pilgrimages um, they made to the to the Eastern gurus, as we were talking about earlier. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Oh, <laughs> I have to read this one. Spike Spikerson says, I'm not allowed to play Jesus anymore since that incident with that nun. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. might make a good podcast in itself. <laughs> right, right. Uh, and know. let's see. Uh, oh, at John H. John H. says, Tim Rice said, I-H-O, that Jesus was just a good person, but not holy man. He wrote that when he wrote Jesus Christ Superstar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the that's the uh, that was the idea. It was trying to strip Jesus away from. It was there. There's actually a whole a whole movement. It's called the the quest for for Jesus, the Jesus quest, and uh, the attempt is to kind of strip away the Jesus of history from the Jesus of faith. And there's been three quest phases, and uh, they basically have all failed. Um, it's really difficult to strip the Jesus of faith away from the Jesus of history because they're they're look I, <laughs> they're one and the same they're one and the same. All right, what else we got as far as questions go? I think oh, Cindy D says I've never seen Easy Rider either. <laughs> well, good. I'm really glad. I think John Collins wrote this. If you oh, that. hello, John. Ian, don't you think that some of the contemporary Christian bands on K-Love type radio stations simply want to be a version of rock stars at any cost? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, you know, this is one of the places in my life where I am not sanctified is in my musical taste because I just don't even care for contemporary Christian music hardly at all. There are some songs and some bands that I really do enjoy listening to, but I don't like listening to Christian rock. Like it just, just turns me off. Just like it's, it's there are some bands that are good, but for the most part, I just am not interested. All right. So, um, so let's move past, unless we've got some more questions, let's move past the hippie movement. Now, now what happens when you have an ideal and the ideal, um, the ideal fails you, do you know, do you know what that spins out? Um, another ideal. <laughs> Basically, but it spins out what's called disappointment. Well, when you when you really believed something was going to work and it ends up not working, when you really have your hope set on something, and it was a hope for these people, uh, it spins out disappointment. And that's what happened. We went from an era of the 60s with the hippie movement into the era of the 70s. And in the 70s, you find two types of predominant musical styles coming to the front that was a spin-off of the, which was a which was a reaction to some degree from the hippie movement. Now there was probably more than two, but I'm going to focus in on two, okay? And the the first one is you find drug use for pleasure only rather than drug use as an ideal. So drug use becomes uh, a means to enhance the party rather than a means to um, to you know, get yourself right or make the world a better place or make you better. And then we saw the rise of cocaine in the late 70s and stuff like that. But really where you see that played out, that ideal played out in music is in the disco scene. The disco scene is a hedonistic scene. So basically... You go from ideal, that ideal disappoints, and out of that ideal, what you have is you have hedonism. 
just this kind of crass hedonism because you say, well, I can't change the world. All I can do is make myself feel better about my situation because the answers that they were being given that were, that were given to them were not substantial answers. So I liken it to like this. I like it. So if you think of it like meals, so think of the forties and fifties, like a good meal, like a good steak, but nobody knows why we're eating it. They don't know what a calorie is. They don't know nutrition. They don't know anything. They just say, Hey, you should eat this. The next generation comes along and they're like the vegans. Okay. Sorry if there's any vegans out there, but the, the the hippies are like people who eat, but they don't have a good source of protein. All right. They just, you just become weak real quickly. You know, it just goes downhill. Well, out of that, you have like people I would, so I would liken it to, um, uh, to uh, the, the, um, uh, the disco to people who are only eating dessert. Like they just, they're just like, Hey man, it's dessert time. Let's just eat dessert, eat dessert, eat dessert. Well, that's like, it's like, if you have, you're going to crash quickly too. And what did we see with, with disco? I mean, it was here and gone, baby. Right. <laughs> it was here and gone by the, by the eighties. It was looked at as something ridiculous. Ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. By the eighties, it was looked at as something ridiculous. So out of this disappointment, one philosophy starts to emerge, and that's hedonism. Now, that hedonism will raise its head again. It actually raises its head again in hair metal. Um, but uh, the other thing that happened was you get violence. You get Because when somebody disappoints you, you tend to be upset with them. Uh, you tend to be mad at them. You tend to be really mad. And the other ideal that comes out and the other uh, music genre that comes out is punk punk starts to emerge and punk was a violent movement originally it was get out of my way they were they were very anti-hippie people don't really realize that it wasn't just that there was just this new movement many of them were very anti-hippie they were saying things like you know don't tell me about peace and they were you know piercing their nose and wearing safety pens in their eyebrows and you know, I mean, and it wasn't, and it wasn't a pretty movement either. It was the anti-pretty movement. It was, hey, what can what can we do ultimately to make ourselves look, you know, bad? Look, look, look bad. So you have these two thing. You have this I almost an ideal of hate or an ideal of anger, I should say, an ideal of anger, um, but but driven by disappointment. And to a large degree, a reaction to the hippie movement. Um, then the other thing that started to be on the rise as far as a philosophy is concerned is existential philosophy. Because you really have nowhere else to go. When you're disappointed and you're disappointed and disappointed, you get existentialism. Now, existentialism had been around for you know a good 50 years. I'm an existentialist this. as fate would have it. Oh, you, you're existentialist as fate would have it. <laughs> ah. What is the mantra of existentialism? I'm going to, I'm going to do this existentialism. Then I want to go back. I see, I see some, um, uh, some people talking, but what is the mantra? Do you know what the basic idea of existential philosophy is? Oh, well, one, but I don't want to say it. Okay. All right. Well, basically it's existence before meaning existence before meaning. So normally we think of the world and normally we think of things as coming into existence for a meaning, okay, for a meaning. So like I'm talking into this microphone, somebody built this microphone for the purpose of me talking into it, you know, or somebody talking into it. But existentialism says there's no intrinsic meaning in anything. Things exist and you have to find the meaning to what, to what they are. So you think about a knife, you know, like if I'm building a knife to cut something, like I make it in a certain way to cut things. I'm cutting it, you know, I'm like, this is what I want to do with it. Uh, but existentialism would say that that's, uh, that's not true for humanity, at least. That humanity, we exist and there is no intrinsic meaning to our existence that we, so we weren't designed, we weren't created, we weren't here for a purpose. You have to basically find your purpose. And there are hopeful existentialists, but they're, they're far and few between. 
and mostly uh, existentialism gets gets uh, devolves into a depression because I mean it's just like you're back to square one you're back to get a good job and work hard for what reason I don't know so that you can just I guess die all right so that's another philosophy that comes to uh, the forefront during this time what have we got as far as comments and questions are concerned DJ Anubis in the house hey DJ I get some striper for you Ian to laugh out loud <laughs> Wasn't a fan. <laughs> Wasn't a fan of Striper. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, laugh out loud. Uh, I laugh at. I laughed a little bit at Striper too. There, there was a little bit of a Christian comeback in all of this stuff too. Um, go ahead. Uh, Flickstacks and Knickknack says, "Hey guys, hey to hey, you. How you like doing, the new brother? icon? Yeah, really good new icon." Uh, Danny Staten says, "Thank God Disco is gone." <laughs> yeah, thank God. Wasn't a well. I don't know. I like Disco. I mean, it was fun. In retrospect, it's fun too, but it's not my favorite music. John Collins says, "People, this is why Ian is actually have a doctorate. He is very learned. This subject is a jam." Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. Really do appreciate that. Yes. What else? <laughs> uh, DJ Nuba says. Punk was anti everything. Laugh out loud. <laughs> yeah, punk was anti everything. It really was. It was. A, it was almost. It was almost anti to be anti. I mean, it really was like uh, if if you if you said black, they would say white, and if you said up, they would say down, and they would say they would go around looking for something to fight about. Go ahead. What else we uh, got? Let's see. Uh, I'm sure we uh, got a lot. I see. A oh, lot I sure do. DJ Numa says. Punk didn't like New Wave, didn't like metal, didn't like disco, and so on. They hated everyone. That's true. Very true. <laughs> Superblick says, disco was before herpes and HIV. Yeah, and it spread around in there, too. <laughs> yeah, it may have triggered both of them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, Spike Spikerson says, punk gave the ugly kids something to do. Snapped. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, to a degree, you could that was like one of the first genres of music where you didn't have to be uh, beautiful to make it. Uh, and that actually is something to be praised as far as punk is concerned, where it really was focused more on the substance of what they were doing rather than the exterior. Uh, everything else. I mean, could you imagine if, you know, if Elvis Presley was as talented as he was, but ugly, he would have never made it. He would have never made it. A lot of these people wouldn't have never. I know tons of people who have beautiful voices, but they're not, you know, what, what the world would consider to be glamorous. And so they don't they don't make it. And wasn't that a direct result of television versus radio? Because yes. the, star, the stars had to be marketable as well as talented vocally. Right, right. Uh, Future Boy says punk movement was really popular in Europe. Didn't it technically start there? No, that's, no, a, that's a myth. Okay. It started here. In New York City. I know there's a big fight. Does the Union Jack have it or do we have it? We actually did have it first, but who cares? <laughs> who cares? It's here, man. Did you ever see that movie, SLC Punk? Um, That's a great movie. I think that's ring a bell. I can't that's a great. It, that's that's a great bell. movie. You got to see it. It was about the punk movie that was going on in Salt Lake City. John H says Quincy had a famous show about punk rock that ended up being unintentionally funny. So people have said, have said, I believe that was supposed to be. Oh, look, I crashed again. Oh, well, no. I'm just going to leave it for now and be, be the continue as the reader. Yeah, please, by all yeah. means. I know there's a lot of stuff happening. Here. Superplex says existentialism is about life being absurd. That's basically what it comes down to. I mean, if you believe that existence comes before meaning, then life is absurd. And you had like the theater of the absurd, too. I don't know if you ever saw any of that. You had a lot of weird stuff, a lot of weird music coming out of existentialism, a lot of weird art where like some girl would just be tied there and somebody would throw poop on her. And some guy would sit there and just do these humming noises and just like go like this on the piano. And at first it was kind of novel and people were paying attention to it. But that gets old quickly. That gets old super, super quickly. And so you don't have that. And, and, and literally, there were whole shows where people would go to these these things and just see these 
um, these bizarre um, outworkings. But that's that, that, quite honestly, let's just be quite honest, it's boring. Like it's kind of cool at first, but you can't like, you know, that, that's worth one album, right? That's worth one album and one tour, and then they, then you're done. Yeah. Uh, Simply D says, I always saw John Travolta in Saturday Night Fever as an extension of the black exploitation films. The way he walked and talked, strutted his stuff, he was shaft. Ah, that's yeah, that's interesting. That is that's a very interesting take. I could totally see that. If we got anything else, I'm gonna uh, oh. I'll go into the eighties. But I want to catch up with people, and then I kind of want to talk about music in the eighties and the philosophy that was kind of behind music in the eighties, uh, and uh, and 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 then into the nineties as well. And I'm gonna stop at the nineties because I've lost touch with reality since then. But Johnny says uh, <laughs> Dallas, Texas had a trash disco night back in the eighties at Club A. <laughs> Remember the roller skating rinks too. I sure do. Ah. We had we had a couple of those here on the Cape. Yeah, yeah, those are fun. I spent a lot of time at at uh, at uh, um, roller skating rings. Uh, one last thing, I just want to read into the record. Digi Duma says Neko says hello, gentlemen, and to you, Neko. Thank you, hello. Neko. Hello. Glad you could join us. And then let's read this one too. Ah, Ian is grunge, the sad stepson of punk. <laughs> yes, I'll get to grunge in a minute, oh. but actually it is. And Lisa Fields is in the house. Hi, guys. Hey, Lisa. And how are you doing? You I'm too, glad you could Lisa. join us. All right. Well, I think we're kind of caught up as far as questions are concerned. Keep the questions and comments coming. Uh, I want to pause on those as, as, as much as I can possibly pause and uh and take those questions as we talk about oh maybe i mean we're talking about culture of of we're we're in the bracket now of gen x um but it's a maybe a little bit more serious of a tone tonight but uh with that said let's with the drink of my coffee here let's get into the 80s all right so there was another cultural significant shift that happened in the 80s with music that uh, helped define the decade and helped even define some new genres of music. Thrash Pondo, do you know what that cultural shift was? Well, the biggest addition to the 80s music scene that I can think of off the top of my head had to have been hip hop. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a type of music, but I'm talking, uh, I'm talking about something else. It, it get, this gave rise to a type of music. Oh. I'll, let you, I'll let you off the hook. I'll let oh, you off the you. hook. It is MTV, of MTV, course. yes. And what happened with MTV, and this is why this is why New Wave became popular was through MTV. Uh, and they called it New Wave because it was the second wave of British vans invading America. Uh, and uh, and and the quite simply why New Wave became popular is they had better videos. Like if you looked at kind of some of the early videos of American bands, they were more like uh, they were more like just I don't know, like like just like playing in a room or something like that. Where if you look at some of those early synth pop new wave bands, uh, they were <laughs> they, they were like telling stories and stuff, you know, like the human league and stuff. Don't you want me, baby? You know that. You know that video was like a story almost that you could that you could follow. Um, and so they they became popular. And New Wave was actually a um, uh, uh, an evolution of punk, but not punk. I know it was it's called it's called post punk. You really get into bands like Joy Division, and then Joy Division kind of gives rise to maybe some synth more synth pop but uh, i don't know exactly how to put it it's not punk i know that it's not punk like sex pistols is punk and something like that but there's a bridge that goes from a band like like sex pistols to a band like jo joy division to a band like uh the cure uh to a band like aha Okay, there's there's an evolution there. There's a there's a connect connectivity there, of of steps. And I say a band like because I'm I don't know exactly when all those bands came out, but you you see what I'm saying. I hope mm -hmm. anyway. 
Um, but things started to get a little bit bigger and brighter. And the reason why is because now you have MTV, so you have a, a competing market. And one of the the genres that she had to forgive my dog. I hope I think people can hear my dog barking in the, <laughs> in the back there. Um, one of the competing um, uh, refueling of hedonistic ideals is hair metal. That is, and it's it's party time. You know what I mean? It's not serious. It's party time. We're gonna have a party now. That wasn't the only thing going on with MTV. You had a lot of other stuff. Uh, other stuff happening there. But as far as an ideal was expressed, hedonism reigned the day. Uh, and, and, and it was just as much as you could drink, smoke, as many women as you could get. Uh, that was really the, the, the force that drove a lot of the most popular bands in the eighties in rock. Now there was also the pop scene as well. I don't want to brush over the pop scene too quickly, but even the pop scene really kind of evolves out of a, a meaningless existentialist ideal. It's just, you know, we're, we're just doing what we do because we want to have as much fun as possible. There were other bands too, but what happened with, uh, with punk rock is it went underground. So you can't, you can't survive on hate forever. I mean, you just can't survive on that forever. That would be like another type of bad diet, right? Mm -hmm. And so I can't, I'm, I'm trying to think of what kind, you know, if, if disco's cotton candy, then what's, 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 what would be the diet of, of punk? I don't know. I guess uh, fast more, food, fast like food. it would that's, be fast food. That's it. That's a great, that's a great analogy. I'm going to use that from now on. Please do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, and so, so punk kind of went underground. It just didn't become popular. And then we got this swell of underground music kind of just beneath the surface in the eighties. So there was a pretty big eighties punk scene in Southern California. Um, there, you know, the, but, but the, the, the strong ideals start to die out. The, it just is, it just becomes a flavor of music. And um, and they start adapting and adopting more different types of music, and it becomes its own thing. Underground music becomes its own thing with punk rock at the root. And they and and how I and how I define alternative rock, which really becomes al what's called alternative rock. Here's what alternative rock is: it's a type of rock music that you cannot squarely peg into one already previous defined genre of music okay mm -hmm. you, you you can't you can't squarely pick it so you might have one foot in say um punk rock your other foot is not in punk rock you know your other foot might be in uh in in uh, acoustic rock so you take a, a band like um the violent femmes Mm -hmm. The Violent Femmes is a classic 100% alternative rock band, early alternative rock. Why is it alternative? Because they have one foot squarely in the punk rock movement without a doubt, but both feet are not squarely in that punk rock movement. They've amalgamated, uh, they've amalgamated, uh, uh, guitar you know um uh, what's that called acoustic rock with punk rock they've amalgamated the two and there were just bands that were doing this all over you look at like the cult the cult was like a blues band with like punk influences you know and and almost even some new wave influences to them so this started to emerge as well too and as the hair band, because hair bands were basically a, a hedonistic uh, ideal, uh, it burns out again, just like just like um, uh, just like uh, uh, the disco movement did before. Disco just went. Shoo, shoo. Now, heavy metal didn't heavy metal didn't uh, in general, but hair metal did. And if you turned on MTV in the late 80s, what would you find? Like a bunch of poison. Mm. warrant i mean it was just all over the place right yes 
Right, right, right. What else? What else was going? What what else was going on in, in those in, in with with music outside heavy metal in in the eighties? Do you remember? Were you were, were you just listening to underground music at the time? Well, I was I was kind of all over the place myself. Actually, just one thing I wanted to point out though about the uh, the whole alternative rock thing is take the Cremps, by the way, which a lot of people tried to label as punk, but Lux Interior always referred to himself as punkabilly. It was, yeah. It was really country music, but with a punk rock spin. Right. So, you know, it's another one of those, shall we say, type of fusion uh, musical groups. Right. Um, but what, one of the things I noticed um, in the 80s, and of course, you know, as you say, heavy metal was certainly there, alternative rock, um, you know, uh, new wave, that type of thing. But for some reason, Top 40 seemed to have a renaissance. Uh, there was that whole, I want to call it, 80s sound easy listening music mm-hmm. where people they it's almost like they wanted their music to not have an agenda they just wanted yeah. a good sound uh and i think there was a lot of that in the 80s i mean certainly people were certainly uh uh politicized right you right. know um i was enamored of reagan at the time and a lot of my friends were actually very conservative there were some new wave hippies that, of course, were also very, shall we say, left leaning. But a lot of people, the, the music, they didn't want their music to have an agenda. So I, I saw this sort of um, new top 40 movement. And there was some actually pretty good stuff that came out of it. There was. There was. We're getting a lot of questions coming through yeah. here. I want to get to your your guys' questions and for, for just a minute. I do want to make one side comment that does influence the, the music of that time, and it is the, the return of the church uh, in a strong way. Because side by side, this whole thing happening, what you also had happening was what's called the Pentecostal movement. And the Pentecostal movement was this almost this, this above the top um uh, church movement that wasn't that was non traditional, and so far I've only defined the church as kind of in this traditional set. Well, there was this non traditional church movement happening that it got expressed finally in Calvary Chapel in the 70s and in the 80s, but then with that, with the popularity and the explosion of Calvary Chapel, you also had the infiltration of Christian music coming to coming to light you had like like the person like a, a, G, a dj anubis said striper and that happening and they did try to make an influence and inroads into all areas of not just heavy metal but they you know but in pop with amy grant and with you know everything they tried to influence that they tried to get into there as well so you have the Christian movement moving alongside of this that was really kind of born out of the Pentecostal movement, which, which again, I would have to take a whole nother lecture to talk to, to trace the Pentecostal through the charismatics and then into the, the third wave movement. And, but, but the result for us tonight is you see a large majority of Christians now infiltrating the music scene with bands like Striper and with pop bands like um like amy grant and things like that so that kind of moves us up into up into the 90s all right let's get to some of these uh let's get to some of these uh questions let's. that we have here uh, spike spikerson asks anyone know about that shag song foot foot yes i do <laughs> uh, listen to the shags they are awful they're <laughs> awful <laughs> they're ironically awful I don't know if you have you ever listened to the Shags. Um, probably I can't place. Oh, you would head. know. I will. Oh now. my gosh. I will oh. know. <laughs> my friend Foot Foot, the worst. That's the what's the worst one they've got. Ugh. John H says the monkeys also inspired music videos with their romps through songs. Yes, they yeah, certainly it, did. That was uh, kind of one of the beginnings of what would later become the vi- the music video. The whole Richard Lester movement. Yes, they sure did. Uh, Future Boy says, you guys are awesome. This is great fun. Love the topic. Love the cultural change and the effect on society. Future Boy, thank you very much. Right on. We love you, too. I'm glad you stopped in for us tonight. And hope you will again. Yes. Uh, <laughs> pardon me. Zuberflick says, John H. The Monkees was inspired by the movie Help by the Beatles. Uh, yep. That, Help was Richard Lester, wasn't it? 
I have no idea. I believe I believe it was Richard Lester. It's above Speaking my pay Lester. grade. Yeah. <laughs> uh, sk- uh, skipping down. Oh, we have Mr. Uh, John Cones here who says, Ian, without trying to be funny or ironic, is there reasoning behind why during the hair metal time frame the male rock stars all tried their best to be androgynous? And Thrash looks very interested. Yeah, I froze up again. Don't worry. <laughs> he thro- he <laughs> froze you up. Um, yeah, well, uh, boundaries were kind of being crossed. It really had to do a lot with how you look on a video, too. And what was interesting is a, is you look at, at at bands like Rat, Motley Crue, and um, who, who are the, the three? And Dawkin. They all had the same stylist. And because they all kind of came became popular at that time, a lot of people tried to imitate their look as well. So um, it was all about, you know, if they've got Aquanet, then I'm going to do Aquanet and I'm going to do it higher and stuff like that. Um, I don't know much more than that. I, I wish I could speak to that topic a little bit, a little bit more, but I think it was just a look that was popular and kind of, and caught on and, that's really as much as I could say about that. I think um, the the what was it? the New York Dolls had something to kind of do with that, and I think also it was kind of the opposite of of Kiss as well. So Kiss was wearing makeup; it was all dark. And you look at say a band like Twisted Sister; they were kind of wearing all makeup, but it was light uh, and and pink instead of dark. And I think that a lot of these bands kind of settled somewhere in the middle. Um, and, and to some degree too, I think it's just a shock value deal as well. You know, it's whatever's going to turn heads and make parents mad. <laughs> All right. Uh, Spike Spikerson says, I dated a hedonistic girl once I married her. I can't blame uh, you, Spike. <laughs> <laughs> can't blame you. Can't blame you at all. Skipping down. Let's see. Um, Ooh, I just want to throw this into the mix. Hungry Jerk says can't stand REM. Oh, that's too bad. They're one of my absolute favorite bands. I got their I got a CD of them back behind me somewhere. Yeah, there's Monster and there's Out of Time. One of my favorite bands. One of my all-time favorite bands. Uh sorry you can't stand them, but hey, it's just taste. You know, I mean people like them, people don't like them, whatever. It doesn't offend me. It used to offend me when I was younger. I'd be like, "Oh no, your band suck, man. They're so stupid." Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, John H. says, I love 50s music. Wish I could still find oldie stations. Unfortunately, the only oldie station that's still broadcasting in my area won't play anything older than Bohemian Rhapsody, 1975. Yeah. You know, it's funny. <laughs> music from 2000 is considered oldies in some circles. That yeah. horrifies me. <laughs> yeah. I know. It really is. It does horrify me, too. Uh, you hear elevator music, and it's Nirvana. On the elevator, well, you know, even going back to the '90s, you know, you'll hear. I'm like, is this, is this smells like Teen Spirit elevator music? In the, it's like, yeah, it is. You're old, okay. <laughs> it happens. DJ Newis says New York Dolls and Hanoi Rocks were some of the earliest glam rockers. Yes, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, they definitely set a trend that people did in some respect try to copy and follow and then go you know go off and 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 make it their own to some degree at least got any more questions or whatever uh, we're gonna... more statements oh here's a good one from a uh, hungry ahead. jerk <clears throat> that dude in hanoi rocks died in an auto wreck caused by vince nessel vince vince neal is what he means there I, 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 sometimes I, I read phonetically i apologize <laughs> i should have known yeah. that was vince neal but yeah I, the... I did not know that yeah, the the yeah he he they they got drunk and went down. I think it was the drummer of Hanoi of Hanoi Rocks. Forgot the guy's name, and Vince Neil went to jail for six months. That's so very sad story. back in eighty five or something like that. I can't remember. I remember Dick Van Patten in Smells Like Teen Spirit video, or was that Weird Al Smells Like Nirvana? <laughs> that, was, that was Weird Al Smells Like Nirvana. Nirvana. Yeah. He's in a lot of uh, Weird Al videos. I love Weird Al. Weird Al is actually, I think, one of the most innovative musicians of our generation. He was he's yeah. really amazing. 
and, and far more um, innovative than I think people give him credit for. They think oh. he just makes parodies. It's way more than simple parody. Anybody can parody something. He really puts a lot of soul into it. He, I, I don't really even know too many other people who do parodies. I mean, I know that it's a genre, but I couldn't name five people who do them. But I know who Weird Al is. Oh, Cindy D says, did you guys like Rapture by Blondie? Loved it. Loved I it. loved uh, Rapture by Blondie. In fact, I got to see Blondie live once years ago, and she performed that song, and it was a highlight. And I thought she was, she's an amazing person. If you've ever had a chance to see her live, check mm. her out. Well, let's finish this off by moving into the early 90s. And then if there's any questions that people have for me about philosophy or about religion in general or about music in general, I'd be happy to answer any of those questions or take your, or take your comments. Um, but what we saw in the, uh, in the 90s, at least one aspect of what we saw. So we did see the rise of hip hop, as you were saying too. I'm gonna not touch that one because I just, I just, that just was not something I was had my ear to the ground, and I would hate to say, but they had their own movement as well that that exploded. I mean, just exploded. But I really wasn't part of that movement, nor did I have my ear to the ground on that movement, and so I don't really know about that a whole lot. Uh, but I do know about the rise of grunge and kind of the philosophy that happened between what's called punk rock and what ha what's called grunge. So hair, so grunge did not kill hair metal. Um, hair metal, in my opinion, killed itself. Okay, it became a parody of itself. I mean, it was just the next person who could. Uh, and it, it really started to fall apart when you start you stop thinking about how good your songs are and you start thinking about how each individual piece of the band is is performing. So instead of being about the band itself, it was about like who's the fastest, best shredder on the guitar. And instead of like what's the song, you know, how good's the song, how how good's the singer? It was more about, well, how good's the singer? Can the singer range those high notes and stuff like that? How good's the singer? So it really started to become kind of a piecemeal rather than cohesive. But what emerged out of that is, uh, is what was called the underground movement. And in the underground movement, the favored child, at least at the very beginning of the underground movement, was called grunge. And as I listed, I believe that grunge is is one aspect of what's called the alternative rock. I don't believe it's everything as far as alternative rock is concerned, but it was the, the, the fair headed, the, the people who broke, broke the underground movement and namely it all centered on Nirvana. Now you can't stay mad for too long and punk rock is fueled by anger. Punk rock is really fueled by anger, but anger burns up quickly. It just doesn't sustain you. And what you have at the end of that is you have despair and you have sadness and you have depression. And I would say that the thing that really separates alternative rock, particularly as it's found in grunge music and punk rock is the difference between anger and the difference between depression. Those are the two that would say that that's the biggest difference is, is punk rock is fueled by anger. Alternative rock is fueled by depression and this culminates ultimately in the in, in the in the highest act of depression, and that's suicide. And I don't know about you, but I know where I was when I heard that Kurt Cobain had killed himself. Mm. Uh, and again, I mean, alternative rock. I mean, that was just one of those flash in the pans as well. I mean, I thought that was going to stick around, and it surprised me too. Like I, so for me back then, I really. I really didn't think all alternative rock was going to like explode, like, like with grunge and stuff. I really thought the future of music was going to be bands like, um, uh, like Ned's atomic dustbin and Jesus Jones and IMF. Do you, are you familiar with any of those bands? Vaguely. It's been a long time. The nineties were a long time ago, but vaguely. Uh, well, Jesus Jones was a pretty popular band. It almost kind of like a, a mellow kind of hippie sound, but a little bit more, a little bit more rock, rocking kind of a thing, and I really thought that was going to be the wave of what happened in, in EMF. Unbelievable! Oh, you're unbelievable! Oh, yeah, yeah, that song. So um, that really kind of um, 
I thought that was, like I said, I thought that was going to be the future of music. But what it ended up happening was, is you had this sadness almost overtake America. And there was a reason why a lot of people don't like Kurt Cobain. I get it. A lot of people can't stand him. But for every person who can't stand Kurt Cobain, there was 20, 30 people who absolutely loved him. And he was a voice of a generation. And the reason he was a voice of a generation is because he was hitting on the very fact that people were sad. That behind this exterior mask of, of hedonism or whatever it was, this mask that they were wearing was really this wounded child. And the wounded child needed a voice. And Kurt Cobain, for many people, was that voice. Personally speaking, I have to say that I, I've said this a little bit before, but I'll I'll tip my hat again. When I was a, a teenager, I really wanted to be the next Vince Neil. I have pictures of myself with long blonde hair. I tried everything to look like Vince Vince Neil. And when the grunge movement hit, I I I switched quickly. I switched very quickly and it, and it, it may look like it, like I was a sellout, you know, like one of those people who shave their head and they, Oh, I've been punk this whole time. I was grunge this whole time, you know, or they get a Mohawk. Oh, this whole time I was this. And I was this way before you were, well, I wasn't, but, but my, my personal switching over that happened so rapidly at about, the, about, about, about the age of 18, from heavy metal into alternative rock was very heartfelt for me because me wanting to be Vince Neil was really just a mask. I wasn't him. I wasn't the rock God. I wasn't the ruler of nine planets and had, I was, I was a loser trying to not be a loser. You know, I, you know, you know, I could fake it really well, but I really knew deep inside. That's not who I was. And so Kurt Cobain spoke to me and, and he made it okay to be sad. He made it okay to not be the prettiest person. He made it okay to be, um, the, 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 the loser. And so my, my jump was quick, but, but it was very sincere. It was very sincere. Well, I wasn't, I wasn't faking it at all. Um, and, and I was devastated when he took his own life. But in the end, that's where that goes. When you don't have meaning and when you step away from meaning, as we saw that that first generation did uh, back in the 40s and 50s, all you can do is try to fuel yourself with these short-term ideals. And these short-term ideals ultimately fail. Uh, and, and we see the ultimate failure in this in suicide. And I think that that is the end of the discussion that bring us to the mid nineties, because the ultimate failure of all these philosophies really brings us down to the absurdity of life without Christ and the killing of yourself. And this is how I see that expressed in music. So now you've heard my lecture that I give at sometimes in some places on the history of music and the history of philosophy and how it, it, it has affected our culture through music. All right. So with that said, if anybody has any questions, I know that the, the chat channel has been going up there. So so ha let me have it. Okay, sure. Uh, John Cohen says, do you think they enjoyed dressing with that and that look? Or did they just know what made money at the time? I, I um I think you're probably going back to the um, the, to the hair metal. glam rock uh, being androgynistic. Probably both. Probably both. I mean, when I dressed like when I tried to dress like a glam rock person, I I did it because I liked it. You know, I think that they knew that it was gonna that that it was making them money. I don't think any of them knew it was gonna make them money when they started. They just were stabbing in the, the dark, trying things, and you know, this one stuck. So I think it's both. I don't think it has to be one or the other. Oh, let's see. Um, uh, uh, let's see. See what we got going on. Oh, Hungry Jerk says, rap at first was fun, good time music. Then it got out of control. I think that happens with a lot of forms of music. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And that early rap, too, you know, like when you had like the Fat Boys. I remember those guys. Oh, I certainly do. <laughs> 
and uh, run DMC and that 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 kind of stuff. That was a lot of fun. What else we got? Uh, let's see. John H says maybe we could have a similar discussion about the evolution of movies. Yeah, I don't. I'm not as good at that with movies. I would have to have a, another expert on a, a little a little bit with movies. I think movies are a little bit different because. To some degree, yeah, you do get some like existential movies or, um, you know, or, or things like that. But I think movies are are a lot of it are just designed to tell us stories. Um, but uh, of course, you do see philosophies creeping into movies as well. But I wouldn't be as good with that. Go ahead. John Collins says, "Ian, can you the- can theologians and archaeologists work together to physically prove the existence of heaven and hell?" Or do you simply only have to have faith and believe it, whether they can prove it or not? <laughs> uh, so uh, this is a good question. So no, um, so uh, heaven and hell are extra dimensional spaces. So you couldn't put them under a microscope and look at them, but, uh, but only to see them expressed in this world. But you can't put love under a microscope either. You can't put justice under a microscope either. So everybody wants justice or where it's justice. Give me a piece of justice. Grab me some justice. No, those are concepts in which um, you you can't place a concept under a microscope, nor can you place an immaterial reality under a microscope. That doesn't mean that under a microscope is the only way to prove something, though. Uh, that's false idea. So it's a false dichotomy to say faith or reason. I would say that faith is the basis of reason. For example, uh, you and I are having a conversation, uh, and this conversation presupposes that we're speaking the same language. We'd have to be able to speak the same language in order for what we're saying to make sense. Uh, In much the same way, that's called a presupposition, and it's called a necessary presupposition. It's necessary that if we're going to understand each other, that we're speaking the same language. Okay, That's a necessary presupposition that we both presuppose before we entered into this, this, uh, this conversation. Christianity is proved presuppositionally. Ra- so, I mean, obviously you can go to Jerusalem, you know, and you can ask like all different kinds of questions and things like that. And you can see archaeology and there there are, are archaeological proofs, but I don't go about that route. I normally go about it philosophically through presupposition. So the presupposition of, let's say, justice or the presupposition of, of harmony I believe rests squarely on an, on a non-atheistic worldview and the presuppositions of logic. So if if I'm trying to be quick here with this, um, but if if logic is to exist, logic is a concept. You can't put logic in a bottle. You can't show it under a microscope. It's a presupposition. The question then becomes: What worldview can account for that presupposition? If you look at the atheistic or unbelieving worldviews, they can't account for that presupposition, although they do use it, and sometimes they use it better than Christians. The question is, is can they account for that presupposition? So, for example, um, I'll give you a, a real, real, real quick example here. We both believe in ethics. We might de- debate whether what ethics are right, but we're debating ethics. But if there's a world in which no God exists, just take that as an an example. If there's a world in which no God exists at all, there's nothing out there. There's no judgment. There's no anything before you die uh, or after after you die. If there's no justice, then why am I under obligation to act just? But if but if you take the Christian worldview, on the other hand, if Christianity exists, exists and there is a very good reason to act just and conduct yourself properly. So we might debate something like, well, should we or should we not get an, get an abortion? But we don't debate the idea that there is morals. And I would say that only the Christian I would say that the Christian worldview is the foundation for the debate in general, not the end of the discussion, but the beginning of the discussion. And I said a lot right there, but let's move on. <laughs> uh, Future Boy says, so the bottom line that people try to create man-made philosophies to replace God and his message. When those philosophies fail them, they turn to suicide. Often they do. Uh, but well, you know, they don't always. That's not always the case. But a lot of times what will happen is, is, and this is the crazy part, is we'll see these things like pop up over and over again. 
you know, you'll see these things pop up over and over again. And part of the discussion that we didn't get to was the differences between, um, um, uh, 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 like this, like we go, you go back to the Socratics and you go to like existentialism. There's like a whole discussion there of, and I'm forgetting the word right now. I'm sorry. I'm forgetting the word. Um, postmodern, pre-modern modernism and postmodernism. And we live in a postmodernist era. And what happens in this postmodernist era is you just find these views recycled because they they don't people don't aren't students of philosophical history let alone history of any kind so they just they just kind of repeat what they did but to me this is like you know watching the same movie and hoping it's going to turn out differently it just doesn't you know it doesn't you can put that dvd in 10 times and you're going to get the same outcome you can employ hedonism 10 20 times 30 times you're going to get the same outcome but some people do some people just say well you know life is absurd i'm tired of living it and they think that nothing exists after death and so this is it so just you know your pain will end okay I hope uh, I said oh on that. dave cleroni in the house dave cleroni says hi guys how do hi. you dave hey dave glad you could make it oh i gotta throw this one there cindy d says america i got <laughs> horse with no name was deep Actually, I've written an article on that matter, and the horse's name was, in fact, Wildfire. Huh. Mind blown. <laughs> Mind blown. Mind blown. And uh, a lot of people just sort of uh, all kind of interchatting with each other, which is always a great thing. Okay. All right. And there we go. All right. So, well. Uh... Oh, actually, is it okay? As, as we're getting ready to close, I want to sign in on my other piece. That way I can actually be yeah. for the last. But I'll be back in a minute. Okay. I'm going to read this here. Please do. Uh, uh, DJ. Anubis writes, well, grunge did kind of kill hair rock because MTV started moving into the alt rock grunge era and shifted their videos uh, more in that direction, even on the headbangers ball, it happened. Yeah, that's that's true. That is true. I, I shouldn't say that I, sh I, you know, I sometimes I overstate my case. I take one element and I make it the whole element, and it's just something I shouldn't do. Grunge certainly did. Let's say it was one of the nails in the coffin of uh, grunge music. Maybe you could have a similar oh, about the evolution of movies. Yeah, we talked about that already. Um, I don't know if we can or can't. Uh, it would be very interesting, though. I, I would have to. I would really need somebody on who who knew more about it. All right, Thrash. <laughs> I think we're. I'm gonna get. Uh, um. Here we go. Tracy Rothmeyer says right here, right now. Can you see that highlighted? I can. Okay. So we're so that's where we are, I think, in the chat. So if you want to scroll down oh. past that and you know. Oh, all right. I'll have to get back in on my other uh you see, I I can't get through the scrolls on my phone, I'm afraid. Oh, oh that's, that's the okay. one downside, yeah. I get it. I get it. Gotcha. All right. Oh, okay. Oh, so you can actually go. Oh, Cindy D says, that was a good song. That song reminds me of the Solid Gold Dancers, LOL, Lisa. <laughs> I, that was <laughs> something I don't know too much about what you guys what you guys are talking about. Okay, let's see. Uh, we got another couple of... Ah, here. John Cullen says, Ian, I guess I always was taught sort of that shell was an old language uh, for hell and that it she... was sort of hmm? go ahead, keep going. Oh, and it was sort of in the core of the earth itself and thus very, very hot and smoldering. That so, uh, sh uh, the word sheol in Hebrew it just means the place of souls or the place it actually means the place of shadows, is all it means. So, sheol is one word for hell, but you get into the New Testament and you have three words for hell you have Hades. Uh, you have you have um, Tataris and Gehenna, and Hades is kind of what the Old Testament term for Sheol is, um, and Tataris is is generally thought of as a place where demonic forces that we're not allowed to uh, migrate to this planet are kept, uh, and then uh, Hades, or no, sorry, not Hades, but the Gehenna is the final resting place 
of the wicked in in uh, in in Christian thought. So there's three words there, and unfortunately, and then you get into the Old Testament with Sheol. Uh, they're all just they're all just called hell, or sometimes in in um, in the Old Testament it's called our the, the Tanakh, more proper name for it. It's called. Um, the place of shadows or sometimes it's called the grave or sometimes it's called it, it or sometimes it's yeah there's, there's a number of ways they refer to it but it's all the same the same word <clears throat> all right <clears throat> uh, dave floney says is it me or was rock in the 70s more about social issues and rock in the 80s more about getting on mtv and other music <laughs> video platforms <laughs> Yes, for sure. That's that. Uh, yeah, that sure, is a yeah. large element of it. And there's all kinds. Like I totally m didn't do the subject of acid rock, uh, mm -hmm. you know, psychedelic rock and stuff like that. With because they were trying to induce some of the uh, some of the types of stuff you'd experience on LSD through the rock music or enhance uh, your LSD trip through the rock music. Let's see what we got going on. All right. Well, what else we got going on here? Ah, Trisha Ross Myers says the Tanakh, the Tanakh is the Jewish Bible. Yes, the Old yes. Testament. The Torah, the ne the Nehavim, and the Ketavim. The right Torah, the, Torah, the, Torah. The, the writing, the, the writing, the 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 Psalms and the Prophets. The the, the yeah Torah, uh, Ket Ketavim and Nehavim. Or no, Nehavim and Ketavim. I'm sorry. I'm butchering that. I shouldn't even try. I've only st I, I I have a cursory understanding of Hebrew. I I come off smarter than I do <laughs> when it comes to that. <laughs> I took Greek one, and then I got halfway through Greek two, and I dropped out because I already can't read well in in one language. So, <laughs> well, anyway. it's all Greek to me. It's all Greek to me. Ah, uh, let's see. Oh, uh, John Collins says, Thrash Pondo, you look so different and young. Is it because you are shaven? I trimmed the beard way back. Thank you for noticing. The only way I can keep it even, Stephen, is if I live like a house, if I go down to the studs. Ah. So it's actually there. It's just very, very, very slight. By the yeah. time I'm on my next show, it'll be a nice full beard again. But I got a haircut, too. So, yeah, cool. I'm, I'm, I'm almost well-groomed. Thank you for noticing, John. <laughs> well i just want to thank everybody i think we're kind of getting to the end of our conversation here it was a lot of fun uh please don't forget to like this video comment subscribe and thrash pondo man we got to get you up there in the to 100 in, yeah to 100 we're real close we need to get your thumbnails going a little bit better but i think that we'll we're, work we're on so that i was actually talking with pat about that yeah <laughs> You're so close but to 100. Yeah. Let's go over and subscribe to his channel if you haven't already. So uh, we're going to close it up for tonight. I did that um, I did that uh, interview with Megapodtastic Guy about superheroes of the small screen, and it is out for the Honeycomb Hideout listeners, but it is going to be out, out for everyone else tomorrow. And there is a guy named Owen from the Action Elite, and I'm getting in contact with him. And we're going to be talking about the action hero icon here real soon. So I, I don't know exactly when that's going to happen, but we're going to be talking about like, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone and Chuck Norris and all that stuff. So that is going to be a lot of fun. And we do have to answer this question here uh, from Zuberplex, which is, it was fun. How is Mrs. Ian C? She is always on my mind, hoping for the best. Thank you very much. I really do appreciate that. Things aren't really going too well right now. They have a she has a lesion on her spine, and it's causing a lot of pain in her arm, like a tremendous amount of pain in her arm. And we're going to go see a radiologist on Wednesday. So um, thank you. Please keep her in your prayers, everyone. Uh, and you know what? I, I generally, like when I started this channel, like I really wasn't interested in like talking about religion, but I'll, I'm open to the topic or philosophy or anything like that. Uh, as long as you guys want to hear about it is if you guys want to hear about it, I'll, I'll talk about anything you want me to talk about. Cause I don't want to close any doors at all. 
Um, but uh, I just want to say thank you very much for hearing this discussion tonight. I hope it was informative, too, about learning about the philosophy behind a lot of our favorite music. And uh, I just want to say thank you so much to everybody here. Uh, it really, I mean, we have such a lively chat channel. Uh, I say it every week, but you know what? I mean it, mean it, mean it every week. I love you guys. You guys are awesome. Uh, I look forward to this Monday night every single week. I look forward to interacting with you guys and uh, being part of this community and you letting me be part of this community. All right. Well, thank you very much and God bless. And we will talk to you all again real soon. Not everyone.